Dear all, thank you for sparing your valuable time on a Friday evening and attending this webinar. This is first of the series of webinars that the Center for Energy Finance at the Council on Energy, Environment and Water will be organizing to discuss the challenges, opportunities and emerging trends in the clean energy sector in India and beyond. The Council is one of South Asia's leading not-for-profit policy research institutions. It uses data, integrated analysis and strategic outreach to explain and change the use, reuse and misuse of resources. The Center for Energy Finance, CEF, is a newly formed team which acts as a non-partisan market observer and driver and monitors, develops, tests and deploys financial solutions to advance the energy transition. It aims to help deepen markets, increase transparency and attract capital in clean energy sectors in emerging economies. It achieves this by comprehensively tracking, interpreting and responding to developments in the energy markets while also bridging gaps between government, industry and financials. Before we start the webinar, there are a few points of hygiene that I would like to mention. I would request participants to stay on mute. In case there are any questions, please share them on the chat box. We have received some questions in advance and thank you for sending those. We'll address them in the conversation. We'll spend next 30 minutes asking questions to Vivek and then open the floor for discussions for the following 15 minutes. I hope you find the webinar useful. As mentioned earlier, in the webinar today we'll discuss floating solar system and its role in the energy transition globally. Any solar photovoltaic system installed on a water body like lakes, reservoirs, dams, mining ponds, industrial and irrigation ponds, water treatment ponds may be categorized as floating solar power plant. To give you a brief background, it has been estimated that even if 1% of the man-made freshwater reservoirs are tapped, 400 gigawatts of solar power capacity can be installed globally. In 2017, Seki had shared an expression of interest to develop 10 gigawatt of floating solar project in three years. However, delays and cancellations of tenders have created uncertainty, marring the market opportunity presenting by, by full floating solar. Currently, the capacity of the largest floating solar power plant in India is 2 megawatt and is installed in Vishakhapatnam, Andhra Pradesh. With increased challenges in availability of land, floating solar becomes an attractive alternative to land-based solar photovoltaic projects. However, limited understanding about the technology and its manufacturing value chain is creating challenges for the government in tendering new projects. In addition, the impact of the project on the water body over its lifespan also needs to be better understood. Today we have with us Mr. Vivek Jha, co-founder of Yellow Tropus, a design and engineering company that focuses and specializes in the development of floating solar power plants. Vivek is an urban and regional planner by training from School of Planning and Architecture and has worked extensively on energy access and village electrification. In 2015, his company Yellow developed patented technologies catering to different needs of the industry and are among the first movers in the sector. They've installed pilot projects in Chandigarh and have installed a floating solar at Raw Water Reservoir of IOCL in Panipat in 2018. Vivek is now working on two utility-scale floating projects in southern states of India. He has six publications in peer-reviewed journals and three technology patents. Welcome Vivek and thank you for joining the webinar. Floating solar is now becoming a hot topic globally, but understanding of the technology limits remains limited. To start with, I would request you to share your initial thoughts around the technology, its potential, benefits and associated challenges. Over to you, Vivek. Thank you, Rishabh. Uh, so, it is uh, quite nice to be here and I, as uh, with Rishabh, I also think that, I also hope that you find this webinar useful. Uh, with regards to floating uh, solar, as you have rightly said, it's a technology which has kind of taken shape in the last few years and but it has immense amount of potential so the as you as you have already pointed out any stagnant water body is a, a good area to kind of start with where we can uh, do it in reservoirs uh, dams lakes and uh, it can be uh, so the basic uh, co-benefits of floating solar they start with A, there is no land acquisition that is required. 
B, once you kind of set up a floating solar power plant, there are energy gains to be had. And also, along with this, one can even work towards improvement of the water ecosystem. But uh, as of today, uh, people who know about floating solar, they have kind of gotten a good idea of where the technology can take us. Right. So as you mentioned, floating solar can probably be installed in most of the water bodies. And the National Register for Large Dam shows that there are approximately 5,000. I put on call. Can you please mute your? Perfect. Thank you. So, Vivek, do you think dams offer a great opportunity, specifically for floating solar in India? And is that the lowest hanging fruit to start with, or would you say there are lakes and other water bodies, inland water bodies, that where the state governments and the central government should target for? Sure. So, uh, rightly pointed out, uh, there are approximately close to about 5,000 uh, reservoirs that are there in India, and these have been created mostly in the time of Green Revolution. So, they, uh, and once these reservoirs are created, the surface area of these water bodies are hardly utilized means they are underutilized, if I may say so. And uh, a total surface area of this is close to about 40,000 square kilometer. And a mere 10% of this can give us about 350 to 400 gigawatts. Um, there are a couple of institutions that are very closely working on establishing the potential. There is a, a World Bank who's uh, looking at it quite closely, and uh, also the other institution that I know of, Terry, they are looking at uh, establishing the potential floating solar in India, and they're looking at it state by state. Uh, an informal number that I got from them um, very recently was somewhere close to about uh, 350 uh, gigawatts. That's considering about 2,700 dams across India. So uh, the utilization of uh, reservoirs, yes, they can be utilized. And this can, why is this reservoirs? This can be taken to inland, res uh, in, inland water bodies as well. For example, a lot of our cities have been losing our lakes. And uh, floating solar per se can help them, uh, can help us conserve these water bodies so that they can A, function the, they can deliver the ecosystem function that they are supposed to deliver and also generate electricity as a co-benefit for it. Um, the uh, other thing for this is that I would like to point out is one of the co-benefits of floating solar power plant which is hugely undermined is the evaporation loss saving. So. Uh, in, in just to give you a fun fact, and this is something that has been spoken about a lot of times, uh, we have close to a loss of 100 billion cubic meters of water, uh, we, and our domestic consumption is close to about 94, 95 billion cubic meters. So actually, we lose more water due to evaporation than we actually consume. Having said that, floating solar to scale, if it is implemented, uh, we can kind of uh, help uh, control almost about 25 BCM of water, which is quite a quite a decent amount of water that can be saved. And um, not only will it help the reservoir retain water for a longer time, in case of hydro projects, it will also help it uh, uh, generate more electricity. This can be anywhere between three to five percent. Okay, that's very interesting, uh, Vivek, and thank you for sharing those numbers. The the numbers are really huge when we compare for the whole country. But say you spoke about the potential of 350 gigawatt national level. We have been recently, there have been uh, suggestions that, or the Prime Minister recently said that we will target around 450 gigawatts of projects going forward. So this means that going forward we may see huge adoption or at least encouragement of floating solar. As of now we don't have a clear policy or a clear target for floating solar. Do you think uh, a target maybe for 2030 would be helpful and will help industry move towards the right direction? Sure. Um, thank you, Rishabh. Um, so, 450 gigawatts is a mammoth target. And uh, uh, as we know, as we move forward, 
land acquisition is becoming more and more difficult. So one of the easiest ways to achieve this scale, to my, to best of my knowledge, is to look at floating solar. But having said that, there are um, multiple policy roadblocks that we need to look at. Uh, number one is uh, that uh, at the end of last calendar year, we were looking at somewhere close to less than a megawatt of installed capacity. By the end of this year, we're looking at close to about 20 megawatts that are going to be installed. Uh, by the end of next year, we are looking at that to grow from 20 megawatts to close to about 350 megawatts. Now, the growth in this entire or the uh, excitement around floating solar has not been linear. It has been exponential. Now, what that does is, uh, uh, and if you look at the other side of the coin, most of the technology providers, though the EPC players and the developers are well established, the technology provider per se are mostly startups. And uh, they, there is not enough uh, focus or there is not enough support that these startups are getting to provide the most cost competitive or the uh, very best technologies. Further, we are in a very cost competitive uh, market which is extremely price sensitive and margins are almost non-existent. And uh, we as technology providers are ready to take up the challenge provided we get requisite support in terms of finances, in terms of policy. Um, the other thing is from jumping to kilowatt capacity to gigawatt capacity, what we have lost out is on the learning curve, and which to my mind is extremely important. Uh, as we move along, and we have to look at floating solar not from a short term from a long term perspective, and if we want to reap benefits of floating solar 20 years down the line, we have to get the technology right. And to my mind, the only way of doing it is to experiment with different technologies and do pilot level um, uh, installations. Uh, there was just one um, other thought that came to me, is uh, uh, there are a lot of countries across the globe uh, such as Korea, Vietnam, that has provided preferential tariffs to floating solar per se. A similar structure can be looked at in India. Now there are multiple co-benefits of floating solar, one of them is evaporation losses. Can that be monetized to bring in an additional tariff for floating solar in the country? That is something that the policy makers ought to look to. Right. There are a couple of interesting points that you uh, spoke about, Vivek. One of the key questions that I would want to follow up, you spoke about the challenges of technology for startups. So how complex is designing a floating solar system to start with and then installing it and then maintaining it? Can a standard EPC company do that or would one require specialized as in skill sets to one design install and then maintain the system over a period of 25 years? Sure. Uh, to this question, Rishabh, I'll take two parts of it. One is the developers and the EPC players, and uh, secondly are the technology providers. Now, um, if uh, the technology is right there, uh, then any EPC player can kind of get into the market and do a floating solar power plant. Um, installation per se is not that difficult, and post the installation, um, the ONM is also not very difficult. In fact, I would go as uh, long as uh, and say that the ONM costs for a floating solar are less than the cost for in, in case of ground mounted. Having said that, uh, the technology per se has a lot of design elements and has a lot of engineering elements that one should not overlook. So uh, we need to design, uh, the whole plant needs to be very aerodynamic because these, um, as apart from a ground mounted plant, wind plays a very big role in, uh, in case of a floating solar power plant. And if the plant is not designed in an aerodynamic fashion, then you can have several out outcomes which are not particularly of uh, negative outcomes, so to say. Uh, Having said that, the technology per se can also make a difference in the generation gains. So one global study that has been conducted, which is uh, by Ceres, 
it uh, based on different technologies they have seen a gain from anywhere between 5% to 15% in the same region or in the same area so depending on what technology you adopt you can also have an effect on the energy generation and third and most uh, the anchoring and mooring, uh, which is the heart of the floating solar power, power plant, is actually a, a, it's actually a different uh, engineering problem altogether. Something that uh, the normal EPC um, are not dealing with at the moment. And uh, this would probably go into the marine sector and uh, there is a bit of expertise that is required to actually design these anchoring and mooring systems and then to implement it. But all of these can be offered by mostly all the technology players that are um, available in India today. Perfect. So companies like yours can of course, will not only be installing floating solar system but also increase the, what do I say, technological intelligence of the sector by providing these expertise, especially from the marine sector. Uh, side of you. Now there are two things that you briefly touched on. One is the cost and the second you spoke uh, talking about the technology. In terms of cost, the lowest that we have seen in terms of tariffs is around 3.29 rupees and these were for large scale floating uh, power plants in the range of 50 megawatt and 100 megawatt. Do you think these are the tariffs which will we'll see similar tariffs going forward or do you see tariffs being reduced probably next couple of years? Do you see the challenge of aggressive bidding that is being witnessed in the sector? And uh, again, these tariffs are in the range of what we see for utility solar power plants, which means that floating solar power plant is nearly cost competitive, which is a good sign. But going forward, do you see the trend of redu reduction in tariffs? And with reduction, do you think there are, comp uh, there are chances of companies compromising on quality? So there are a lot of follow-up questions that often come with tariffs also. Sure. Uh, Rishab, you have coupled a lot of questions together and uh, I'll try to the best of my knowledge to answer them. So uh, one coming firstly to the tariff per se, tariff per se is a, a combination of cost and generation. Now um, floating solar, uh, the data for floating solar per se is very limited. So as of today and uh, what is being done is because there is no uh, probably tabulated form in which that if you apply at this latitude or this uh, longitude, this is the kind of benefits that you're going to get. So what uh, most of the developers and EPC players doing today are they doing a PV cyst analysis, which kind of results in generations for ground mounted plant and then taking the global experience of getting a 5% to 10% gain, they are guesstimating and putting that over the generation. Now, what that does is, uh, however, better, however good you are at the back end of your guesswork, but it's still at the end of the day, guesswork. That is why I said that we are jumping the curve and we are uh, losing out on the learning curve. Uh, what is extremely important at this juncture is that we have uh, apart from having large scale projects, we also need to have multiple of these small scale projects which give you an idea of where the data is going. So uh, data for Rajasthan will be very widely different from data that you will get from a floating solar power plant in Kerala. Um, and But uh, we know that there will be a variation but we do not know how much. So once um, developers and EPC players have this kind of data on hand, they would be in a better position to bid. And what, uh, um, so this is the uh, part where the science comes in. But uh, there is the other part that uh, floating solar being a new product in the market, we also have seen a lot of aggressive bidding in uh, in the sector which does not bode well for anybody because it's a new technology there are um, there are multiple things that uh, a developer might ignore or a dpc player might ignore and which might come to a technology provider or a technology provider might ignore which kind come to a epc player so when you um, when you bid very aggressively you are cutting down your on your contingencies very much you're obviously cutting down on your margins but contingencies as well 
which means that a um, you're trying um, there are uh, quality cuts which will come with very aggressive bidding but with the question of tariff as we see the scale improve in the right fashion with the right numbers with the right generation with the right technology we can see the tariffs go a little lower than what they are as of today but that needs a lot of policy support to kind of understand uh, what the generation numbers are going to be what the technology how is it going to perform over the period of 25 years and so on and so forth right so probably when we start getting data from these large scale power plants we'll the learning curve would improve and we'll see more companies bid probably if not aggressively will take a caution as in take a better approach and bid for projects uh, that are coming along but given all the ben and the second point that i would now want to touch on is when you compare a floating solar power plant with a ground mounted power plant how much is the difference in terms of capex cost and the onm cost onm cost you mentioned that there's not it's actually lower if you compare to uh, to a generic general uh, uh, power plant but in terms of capex cost what is the difference and is does that also result in the excess energy that is generated from a floating solar power plant sure so sure. so on an average uh, one can say that you can get about approximately about 10% higher uh energy fix uh, energy energy from a floating solar power plant but this is generic now in rajasthan this can be as much as 15% and in some other places it can be lower as well but having said that um the um, the capex as of today it is approximately about 10 to 15% higher uh in the overall cost so if you kind of combine the two together you can uh, come to the same ground but uh, again i repeat these are the learnings that need to come to the industry before the industry can actually take a knowledgeable decision or an informed decision of where it wants to go now um as i said last calendar year we are looking at kilowatt level installations this calendar year we are looking at megawatt level installations and this is as we see there are um, this is just going to increase and it has increased exponentially but what it has done is most of the tenders that have come up they have been designed for cost competitiveness and not for the technology uh, point of view um which means um these tenders are designed for reverse auctions and which um in the uh, which as a result result in very aggressive bidding so which at this juncture probably is not the best thing the tender should be designed in a way where a major portion of the tender should be allocated to technology or technical side and not to the cost side of it and and two or three years down the line once we know what the technology is one can go on to the aggressive path which nobody is stopping right so maybe the suggestions like preferential tariff for floating solar power plants or even maybe in the initial stages we have specific technologies that may be supported for floating solar power plant can be encouraged given all these benefits what are the policy roadblocks that you see that is still holding back the sector we see there are tenders that come up and there are cancellations that happen keep happening here and there what is the challenge that companies or off takers or policy makers see in setting up new power projects um uh, in the sector of floating solar these can be categorized into two or three one can be at the time of bidding now if i am uh, if anybody any of the developers are bidding for a large scale plant they would like to know all the risks that are there so that they can be monetized into a tariff and they can provide a tariff which is possibly something that is a win win situation for everybody but as of now how the tenders are being designed they do not have too much data in them or not too much information is shared up front so simple things like uh, um how the bathymetric is or how the hydrography study is or what kind of other livelihoods exist in that 
um, reservoir. So, for example, uh, there can be a reservoir where there can be a lot of fishing community involved. Now, the moment you put up a floating solar power plant that has certain amount of coverage, you are restricting the livelihoods of those fisher folk. Now, uh, how this can be avoided is before a tendering authority kind of takes out a tender, they study it in terms of what are the social impacts, what are the environmental impacts of it, and plus provide as much data as possible to a developer so that they can take into account all the risks. Uh, so that's the way that current technology, uh, current tendering is happening. But apart from that, uh, policy roadblocks, we need a lot of standardization in the uh, technology per se, uh, not in terms of technology, because the moment you try and standardize technology, you kill innovation, but in terms of what are the standards that one can look at. I'll give you a very brief example that uh, the uh, wind profile that we follow or what we design for is based on a standard code called IS 875 part 3, which is made for buildings uh, above 10 meters height. So, it, and floating solar power plant per se is just at the maximum about to one meters, one meter from the water plane area. So, um, taking that poly, uh, taking that standard and then putting it onto a floating solar power plant um, ca ca causes a mismatch. So there needs to be studies that need to be done and standards need to be s established for what, how will you design your wind uh, or how will you design for wind. The wind profiles change as the height increases and all of this needs to be taken into account. Then secondly, with the kind of material being used, um, for example, most of the tenders, uh, I don't know how this word kind of creeped into the floating solar industry, but HDP has become a much favored word. Uh, HDP stands for high density polyethylene. And uh, though some of the tenders kind of open it to thermoplastic, but the moment you kind of restrict it on material again, you are restricting the level of innovation. For example, at the same cost as today, or probably lower, I can design or we can design concrete-based floaters. Okay. But uh, these same things, um, uh, since the tender restricts us, we cannot go in that direction. Right. So what has happened is they have used the existing power plants or the existing floating systems and bases those we have just designed our tenders, which is of course not the right way going forward. And the conversation that we have been having, it seems like there are a lot of technical nuances that go into floating solar power plant, right? The policy makers may take time, developers may take time, and there are a few companies like yours who can really, or who really have the time and resources to explain all of the technology and the nuances to uh, these important stakeholders. But one other important stakeholder that we have been missing is the lenders. They took a lot of time initially when the National Solar Mission was launched to understand solar technology and even have had lender engineers at that point of time who would go explain to banks, maybe international financial institutions, what solar power plant or what solar technology is. Do you think, how do you think would that uh, bridge be formed between now floating solar systems and lenders like say SBI, Yes Bank or even other organizations, IREDA, are they confident about the technology or they still have questions on technology and the long-term uh, stability of the technology in the first place? So uh, lender confidence is improving as we move along, but of course uh, as long as there are unseen risks, the lenders will be very good. So the only way that the lenders can be calmed is by giving more information. And rightly, as you pointed out, there were lender engineers or there was a group of people who was moving around, who were moving around during the initial solar mission. And that were importing this information to these lenders. So slowly by slowly, the, they saw the risks going away. And as the risks go away, the uh, lender confidence will improve. Uh, for example, the impetus on costs, um, reverse options, this needs to go at this juncture. Uh, it has to be more technically focused. Um, then pilot projects, the more pilot projects or the more learnings that we have from this industry, the better it is. 
Also, I'll take a, an example from the wind sector. Now, before we launched on to this, uh, putting up these wind farms in different places, let's say uh, the coast of Gujarat or uh, coast of Maharashtra or down south, um, there were a lot of studies that were conducted. And a lot of studies kind of analyzed what is the wind pattern, which side is the best side to kind of put these wind turbines, uh, where all can this be housed, what is the best area. I don't see that happening for floating solar. As of now, um, it is that, okay, there is a dam there, let's go and put up a floating solar. Um, there is not too much feasibility that's happening. And that is extremely important. So with feasibility comes information, with information comes you, where you can categorize risk and that uh, gives you the way of de-risking yourself to the extent possible or uh, reducing the risks so far. Right. Okay, makes sense. For those on the call, uh, the question and answer session with Vivek will continue for around probably next 10 minutes. In case you have any follow-up questions from the conversation, please send them over chat. We'll take up after uh, the Q&A session is finished. Thank you. Following uh, what you said, Vivek, on the feasibility study, in terms, I mean specifically for India, do you see there are any specific few states which can take the lead uh, in setting up floating systems? Or say, is the western side of the country better than the eastern part of the country? Or would that really matter in terms of what is the basic requirement to set up a floating solar? And if you would have to pick up your few states, top three states, which one would those be? So a beautiful, uh, that's the beauty of floating solar. Um, when you talk about normal ground-mounted solar, you're looking at uh, probably the western region, you're looking at the southern region, uh, which where your um, degraded land is available or your waste land is available, which can be uh, used for uh, putting up ground-mounted solar power plants, which also regionalizes the whole power plant segment or the solar segment. The beauty about floating solar is these water bodies are equitably distributed all across India. So to answer your question, question shortly, no, it will not make a difference whether you go north or south or east or west. Um, these are equitably distributed and you can have uh, plants ranging from a few megawatts to in gigawatts in reservoirs that are existing. But um, having said that, a lot of uh, understanding for all the water bodies need to be done before you actually do. So, for example, a uh, very important uh, information um, for designing your anchoring and mooring system is the wave pattern or the current pattern, which is not available for any reservoir in India. Okay. Secondly, things like uh, what is the water level variation over the years. Um, that kind of data is not available. So you do not know what the variation in water levels are and how do you design your anchoring and mooring system. So these information need to be made um, need to be made available to bidders and developers, so that at least the costing can be done right. And um, bathymetric and hydrographic are just two examples of these information, but a lot more is required to make a decent bid where this can be taken. Okay. So following uh, following question, say for example, in the earlier uh, earlier in our conversation, we had also mentioned that organizations use PV sys and then do a guesstimate uh, to estimate what will be the estimated generation of the power plant. Do you think companies like PV sys and others uh, or the software developers on which EPC companies and developers rely on need to add modules, as in when I say modules, as in they need to update their softwares where one can then decide is it a rooftop system, is it a floating solar system, or is it a ground mounted system. And then if you say that, okay, I'm installing a say a floating so system in a lake, in a freshwater lake, and this will be the generation. Do you think initiatives like these are also required not just from policy makers, but also in terms of technology providers like PVSYS and others. Sure. And uh, uh, we have been talking to PVSYS, we have been talking to Heliscope, Solar Labs, and uh, uh, they have, they have, um, they definitely have to put this module up, so to say. But having said that, um, 
doing this mathematically is one thing, but validating it through data is just another. So we at this juncture do not have enough data. And to get that enough data, we need to kind of do pilots across India in different geographical locations. So these data points can be collected and given back to PVSYST who can validate it with the mathematical models and put up something that one can rely on. So uh, it's a matter of chicken and egg. Right. So PVSYST will not have a very accurate model unless it is backed by data. So the PVSYST generation data today is backed by a lot of uh, information that came from the industry over the years. Similar kind of information needs to flow in to PVSYST from existing plants. Makes sense. So data sharing is very important if you want to make sure that uh, going forward we'll have gigawatts of floating solar installations. Absolutely. One of the things that would also be required if you want to have gigawatts of floating solar installation is the people to install it. Mm -hmm. Do we have the right set of skill sets? Are these skill sets transferable from the existing uh, workforce that we have for ground mounted and rooftop? Or do we again need to say update our curriculum at ITIs, at uh, engineering colleges, or maybe other courses to make sure that people who are working to one work on floats, maybe on designing the floating system, uh, they have the necessary skill set so that these power plants can also last for 25 years. So the importance of skill sets uh, uh, relevant to the technology. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, skill set, uh, I can divide the skill sets into different parts of uh, establishing a solar floating solar power plant. One is the design and review, the feasibility study. Of course, we need a different kind of skill set to undertake the feasibility study, whether it's from the environmental point of view or from uh, um, the uh, social point of view. So that is number one. Then while designing the floating solar power plants, there are some nuances that come with floating solar that need to be appreciated, but that is something that need not be uh, made afresh. The current lot that designs power plants can easily shift to this. Uh, the uh, installation is simpler than a ground mounted plant. So uh, you not much special skills are required in the assembly and installation of the plant. Uh, once the plant is on water, it is pretty much like a ground mounted plant where you can walk around freely and you can pretty much do whatever you want. So those skill sets can absolutely remain the same. So, and with growing installation, you will need more number of those people to come forward. The only specialized job when I say, uh, when it comes to floating solar, is for the equipment handlers during the anchoring and mooring time, and also during the design phase of it, the marine side of it, or the water side of it. Those are these uh, extra skill sets that would need to be brought into the industry. And there are uh, courses which are already available in various engineering colleges or ITIs where people can pick up those skills and join in. So it diversifies the solar sector a little more. You can have a lot more interesting people coming into the solar sector and possibly but the numbers need to grow up. Perfect. Two more questions before I start taking up the questions from participants. One. I mean, another motivation to install floating solar, I mean, uh, to install solar systems in the first place is the number of jobs that are created, right, in the solar system. Rooftops create more jobs when you compare to ground mounted projects or the utility scale projects. But in terms of rooftop, uh, in terms of floating solar, what do you think more jobs would be created when compared to the utility scale solar power plants that just can be an additional motivation or be a selling point to suggest or to have increased installation of floating solar going forward? Uh, what can be done is uh, a lot of livelihoods can be interlinked with floating solar. For example, uh, fishing as an activity can be very easily interlinked with floating solar. Uh, you can have things like fish hatcheries uh, which can be integrated with a floating solar power plant. Uh, 
So, if we do not, the number of people required would be probably be similar to a utility scale power plant, depending on what scale you're talking about. But a lot of additional livelihoods can be created out of this, if you get what I mean. Um, so, um, additional livelihoods, fishing is one very big example. Um, tourism can come up along with floating solar, uh, where these um, these power plants are, um, they can be made aesthetic, they can be converted into areas of natural tourism. So a lot of ancillary industries can come along with floating solar and not just that. Apart from that, one has enormous capabilities of doing wetlands, uh, of uh, um, to improve the water body as well, plus give it a more aesthetic look and you have a certain type of skill set. Uh, um, you can, means pretty much there are a lot of uh, sectors that one can go into, right. which we haven't experimented with yet. Okay, that's very helpful, Vivek. So we have eight minutes left uh, before we close the webinar, and there are a few very interesting questions that we have received from the uh, participants. So Karthik uh, says that what will be the right approach to get policymakers interested in the learning curve? Adding on to this question, so MNRE, SEKI, IREDA, all these government organizations are of course responsible to make sure floating solar, uh, as in the solar sector moves forward. But specifically for floating solar, what are the other uh, complementary departments? Uh, like, of course, Ministry of Fire is there, but do you see maybe Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Water Resources, and others? What is the kind of narratives that we would need so that all these ministries come together and we see greater interest in floating solar? So the biggest point of interest is to look at our targets and the way to, easiest way to get there uh, and the most scalability is available with floating solar. So you have these reservoirs which do not, uh, which do not need any acquisition. They come with evacuation facilities, so the evacuation of power is not too difficult. So it's a very um, uh, low-hanging fruit, to say, to scale up the solar sector in a rapid mode. Um, but uh, uh, having said that, yes, a lot of uh, different departments need to come together. Definitely Ministry of Water, different, definitely Ministry of Irrigation, uh, Water Resources, Irrigation, uh, the various state government bodies which own these reservoirs and dams, um, SECI, MNRE, of course, the usual suspects in terms of policy makers need to be there. So, and uh, plus, uh, a different uh, breed is also required in terms of certifications. Right, okay. Um, so, you need good bodies that can certify technology before, because uh, the requisite skill sets are not available as of today. So I, as a technology provider, can provide you a technology. Uh, the person who is evaluating on my technology might not be the best person. So you need an intervention there where certain certification bodies come into play. And uh, these need to be kind of taken up by the ministries um, they need to kind of uh, be promoted by the mayor, ministry so that um, the technologies that we deploy are better and uh, last for the time that they're supposed to, meant to. Okay. Following up from, for the questions that we've received from participants, so Ashok and Surbhi, they talk about conflict and water rights. They're saying, I mean, we did hear that MSCDCL had shared a tender of one gigawatt of floating solar, but while there was no official, official reason uh, given why the tender was cancelled, but we hear that there were some local conflicts and local challenges that were witnessed with the farmers and other local stakeholders, and hence the tender was either pushed or cancelled. Do you think going forward this will be an area of concern where farmers or maybe other stakeholders who are affected by floating, maybe uh, fishermen, if they are affected by floating solar power plants, how do we tackle these going forward? Sure. So, uh, also I heard about MSCDCL, the other reason is uh, uh, it didn't show a lot of, a uh, lot of developers didn't show interest because the tariff was capped at 3 rupees. Right. Okay. Now, that was an extremely aggressive uh, tariff to start with. 
uh, unless you're looking for a dual axis tracking plant, but that's not for me to say right now. But having said that, um, um, how we can avoid these conflicts is because we have 40,000 square kilometers of these underutilized water body, water surface area. Uh, one can easily identify places where the conflict are minimal and still we'll be able to cater to a large amount of our target from these. Let's say even if we target about 500 dams in the coming five years, um, each, each dam looking at about 100 megawatt, you have a huge number in front of you. Right. Uh, you have 50 gigawatts right there. So you don't have to go to all 5,000, even a mere 10% of it would be able to kind of help you on your path. So A is identifying areas where the conflicts are the lowest. B, finding remedial measures. So another example of this is coming from Indonesia, where they are looking at a reservoir uh, where fishing is done on a major scale. So what they have done is they have segregated the reservoir into two or three different parts. So one part is where the tourism is allowed, one part is where the fishermen, fishermen are allowed, and the third part is where they want to put up a large scale photo floating solar power plant. Okay. So that's an interesting we, approach. Yeah. Right. So one more question that we received is, can we combine floating solar power plants with offshore wind, and can they work as a complementary technologies? Sure, I, they can, uh, but again, uh, this is at this current juncture, uh, I would say deep offshore, um, not many technologies are there which will uh, get you to, but I know of a lot of people, including ourselves, that are working towards uh, getting this possible, um, because then the scalability just becomes uh, enormous of uh, floating solar. There are challenges with doing offshore, but uh, and uh, unless uh, you do multiple pilots and you do multiple learnings uh, of it are um, received, um, it's still about five or seven years. Okay, that's that's very helpful. Few last questions again on the cost. That remains a very important topic for a lot of people. Like, what is the cost? So when you compare, where Satya asks, when you compare with regular MM module mounting structures, how would the cost of float be different? Doesn't I mean? I assume that would be additional cost. But what is the variation probably on uh, the cost of floats when you compare to the module mounting structures? So as I said, this kind of adds about uh, 10 to about 15 percent. Uh, over your overall capex. And uh, most of this addition comes from your flotation devices and anchoring and mooring systems. Now, uh, a lot of it is variable. It depends on where we are putting up. Anchoring and mooring can become extremely expensive if I'm looking at a um, reservoir which is 90 meters deep and has a great amount of water variability that the anchoring and mooring system can become very expensive. Uh, compared to a uh, um, medium-sized reservoir where the variation is not much and it's about 20 to 30 meters deep. So overall, uh, the differential is the delta is about 10% of the overall capex cost. And that is rapidly decreasing as the industry is progressing. With maturity of technology. With maturity. So in closing, I would uh, ask you, maybe five years down the line, what is the what are the numbers that you would look at in terms of installations per year for floating solar? So uh, let's do a little math. So I, I if I look at uh, doing about uh, uh, let's say about a uh, hundred reservoirs in the next year, um, the average capacity of a reservoir is going to be about 100 megawatts because that is what is going to make sense. Um, Having said that, pilot projects are extremely important and we need to keep doing pilot projects. People like Seki who are doing large-scale tenders, people like NTPC who are doing large-scale tenders, NHPC, um, uh, NHDC, your Damodar Valley Corporation, all these players, apart from setting up these large-scale solar power plants, need to understand the feasibility and undertake pilot projects 
are not too big, let's say a uh, um, couple of hundred mega kilowatts or probably a megawatt, just to understand what are the generation and what are the different kind of challenges that one can come along. But having said that, 100, 100 dams with 100 megawatt um, each, you're looking at a 10 gigawatt number next year onwards. Okay. So, yeah, depending on uh, number of reservoirs that we are willing to tap, right. and that depends on uh, uh, who is the off taker, where is the reservoir. So, uh, if those are simplified and those are made available, a more structured tender is made, then yes, we can target about a hundred um, reservoirs per year. Okay, that's uh, thank you for that, uh, Vivek. So, this in closing, I mean. If you have any uh, final comments on floating solar, I would want you to share those. Otherwise, there I have some concluding points for the participants. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, to our mind, uh, environmental factors uh, with regards to floating solar need to be studied. And uh, uh, there, uh, there needs to be studies that can need to be um, initiated by either the governments or by uh, people like the World Bank or GIZ or um, one of these bodies who are looking at floating solar in an interesting part uh, to see that uh, after covering about 10 to 20 percent of the water body, what kind of effects. Uh, and uh, right now from experience we are saying about 20 percent or 30 percent coverage, but this needs to be kind of validated from some data. Um, we need to identify the right institution to study these impacts and we need to get ASAP onto these studies. Um, the other is the very big question that our tenders need to kind of move away from the cost part of it if we want to see floating solar to be a sustainable solution over the coming years. Otherwise, uh, with the cost comes quality cuts, comes uh, uh, skipping of gaps and which is, does not bode well for the industry, which is still at a very nascent stage. So more, uh, yeah, no more uh, uh, importance needs to give, uh, be given to the technical side of it. And also the information from the tendering authority as much as possible needs to be made available to the bidder before the bid is actually done. So a lot of homework needs to be done in, in a nutshell before we actually jump all, all, all along. So probably one year of doing this homework and then yes, you can start looking at a um, 10 gigawatt per year potential year on year. So maybe in, at a lower number of installations with better monitoring of projects will lead to greater number of installations at a later stage Absolutely. and reduce the challenges going forward. Absolutely. The webinar, I mean, after the conversations and continued uh, discussions on floating solar, one, is, one can be definitely show that there's huge potential going forward, but we definitely need uh, long-term studies to understand what is the impact of floating solar on the water ecosystem, as Vivek had mentioned. There's also a greater need to do data sharing between various stakeholders in the sector, maybe between developers, between off-takers, government policy makers, with the EPC companies, manufacturers. We also need a clear target and a roadmap, which will give the comfort not only to developers but also to lenders that government backs floating solar going forward. I hope you found the webinar useful. Going forward, we'll try to have a webinar every month. The topics that we plan to discuss are energy storage, upcoming module technologies, forecasting scheduling, operation maintenance, transmission infrastructure finance, inverter technologies, policies, etc. In case you have any suggestions on the topics of webinars, please write to the email ID ces at the rate cew.in uh, and we'll definitely try to set up a webinar on the topic above. Thank you so much for connecting. I hope you found the webinar useful. Thank, Thank you, you Vivek, for joining. Thank you so much Thank for having me.